Welcome everyone to our weekly chat with Toronto's Associate Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Vanita Dubey. Thank you for joining us again today. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Dilshad Berman. I am a writer and reporter for City News and 680 News, and I will be moderating this chat today. How it works is we have been collecting your questions all week, and we will present them to the doctor. She's never heard them before, um, and she's going to give us her best answers. We're going to try and get in as many questions as we can into this short half hour period that we have with the doctor. If you haven't had a chance to submit your questions, you can do so underneath this broadcast, and we'll try to get to as many live questions as we can. So doctor, let's get started. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Um, let's start with our vaccine questions as we've been doing for the past few weeks, lots and lots of questions about vaccines recently. So let's start with Mary. Mary says, I have had a heart attack and I have a weak immune system and have previously been on a, on a ventilator um, and had a tra trachea, I guess tracheotomy. Um, about when will I get vaccinated? So, uh, Mary, we're waiting to hear on what the next round of uh, individuals is going to look like. There have been um, uh, some groups that have been announced in the stage two. Um, it's hard to know whether those who have chronic health conditions, which particular conditions, where they're going to be uh, situated. So um, more to come on that. Uh, certainly recognize that you are at higher risk. Uh, if you got COVID. So I think for now, what I would say is make sure that you take all of your precautions to prevent COVID. Um, and we are certainly in a place today where we have less vaccine than we anticipated. And so it may take a little bit longer. And so um, as we get more vaccine, we'll be able to vaccinate more, especially higher risk people like yourself. Okay. Um, and then a uh, retired physician asks, um, I do not understand why we are not testing people for antibodies rather than blindly using a partially approved vaccine. There exists potential for unknown long-term effects, particularly of mRNA vaccines. So why should we risk vaccinating people who are already antibody positive? So we know that uh, people who have previously had COVID can uh, get COVID again. That's part of why uh, we're offering vaccine to people who may have previously had COVID. Um, we know that antibodies do wane after you've had an infection. With some infections, when you get the infection, you're actually extremely unlikely to get infected again. And with COVID, um, it's hard to know how likely it is, you know, but we there are certainly uh, many, many cases of reinfection. And we know that for some groups, especially those who live in a long-term care home, for example, if you got COVID there, it, it, uh, you could have very severe outcomes. And so that's why uh, people are being vaccinated um, uh, with the vaccine. Again, choosing to get vaccinated is an individual choice. It is based on informed consent, um, balancing the benefits of vaccination, um, the safety of the vaccine with your own individual risk and level of tolerance. Absolutely. Doctor, can you address uh, the part that he said, uh, he or she said about a partially approved vaccine? This has been properly approved in Canada, correct? It's not just emergency. Correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. It's not partially approved. It is fully approved by Health Canada. The National Advisory Committee on Immunization has also reviewed the data and provided their recommendations. The approval process was complete. The change in the approval process was that uh, rather than waiting for everything to come, we did it or it was done sequentially or uh, uh, as information came in, it was reviewed uh, rather than waiting for all of it to come in. And so that's what sped up the process for approval. Um, but it was, it is not a partially approved uh, vaccine. Yes. Thank you for, for clarifying that. For sure. For sure. Um, okay. Let's move on to Goldie's question. Uh, Goldie asks, can you please offer advice on how long a healthcare worker should wait to get the vaccine after already having COVID public health was unable to answer? So there is no um, interval that you have to wait. Uh, the National Advisor Advisory Committee on Immunization says that you can wait uh, three months uh, from when you had COVID to when you get vaccinated, especially in a situation where there's a sh uh, less supply of vaccine. Uh, we know that reinfection within the first three months is less likely. So if you wanted to wait, that might be an interval that you could consider. Uh, but you don't have to wait as long as you're not contagious, um, you're cleared from the COVID infection, you could get vaccinated. Okay, okay. Um, and then a pharmacist asks, when will pharmacists be vaccinated? Um, I would hope it would be soon in Ontario because they want us to provide COVID vaccines to the public. 
Yeah, so another really great question. So um, a lot of work is being done on this, on who the next groups of prioritization will be. Um, uh, people in the public who have health conditions by age, by uh, profession. Um, and so that has not been landed on yet. There has been some information uh, released, like, for example, essential workers, frontline workers, uh, but not uh, in enough uh, clarity to be able to to give people a good sense of when they their turn will be will come right right and i think a lot of the the questions are who is essential and who is not because so many even our grocery workers are essential workers pharmacists would be seen as frontline if they are actually immunizing people so all of that still has to be worked out that's right we need clarity on all of that absolutely okay um uh, and then jennifer asks i've actually seen this a couple of times online this week um, Jennifer asks, I've read some stories on people dying shortly after getting the COVID vaccine in the Netherlands, um, elderly people in nursing homes. Uh, and she says there was also a case of a doctor probably from Florida, she says, who developed a rare bleeding disease within days of receiving his second shot of the Pfizer vaccine. The question is, are these one offs or is this something we should be concerned about? Um, what has been the most severe bad reaction to the vaccine in Ontario so far? Yeah, so you can expect that uh, even in Toronto, we're vaccinating uh, as many residents as we can in a long-term care home, and people um, can naturally die or can die of other things, even though they receive the vaccine. And so part of what we have to tease out is cause and effect. Just because you got the vaccine two days, five days, 10 days, 20 days, you know, even a year uh, before, and then you die, is that death related to the vaccination? And so that's part of what's going to need to be looked at every time there is a death when someone was recently vaccinated. Is there another reason to explain the death where they expected to die, th that kind of thing? Um, and same with conditions that, you know, if someone develops a condition shortly after vaccination, we have to see if it's related to the vaccination. We have to report it as an adverse event following immunization. That just means it happened after vaccination, but it doesn't mean causality. And so I think as we get more information, we'll be able to determine, well, is this really related to people who are vaccinated? Because then you will expect to see more of those uh, illnesses related to people in the vaccine group compared to people who didn't get vaccinated. And so I, I think that's what I can say. So for right now, I can say based on the studies and even based on um, the vaccines that have been provided to date, uh, you know, the most severe side effect that we see is that anaphylaxis, uh, that severe allergic reaction uh, that is treatable, that the clinics, wherever you get the vaccine has to be prepared with uh, epinephrine, like an EpiPen, for example, to treat that uh, and to follow up with hospital care. So doctor, after an anaphylactic reaction to the vaccine, say, does that mean that the vaccine has not worked for you? Or is it just that that's your reaction? It's still going to work its way in your body, but you just had this reaction. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you were you received the vaccine. So if your body develops an, an immune response, um, it will develop that response. But because you had the anaphylactic reaction, it means that you cannot receive that vaccine again. That That is one of the few contraindications for vaccination. Right. So no booster do dose for that person then? That's right. Right. Okay. Um, all right. So let's move on to Joe. Uh, Joe asks, we've heard a lot about the delay in the Pfizer vaccine. Um, where is the Moderna vaccine being used right now? Uh, the Moderna vaccine is here. Uh, it's in Ontario. It's being used in some long-term care homes. It's being used at some uh, clinics, like Toronto has a, a proof of concept clinic that's occurring right now for frontline shelter uh, workers, for example. And it's the Moderna vaccine that's being used there. So um, it is definitely being, uh, if it's available, it's being sent out and being used again for that priority uh, population or for Toronto's case for that prior, that proof of concept clinic. Right. And the, the clinic, unfortunately, is, is having to pause on Friday, though, correct, because of the lack of vaccine supply? That's right. So even though it switched to it is only giving Moderna, there is still even shortages of the Moderna vaccine. And so the clinic will just be for this this week. Yeah. Right. Right. OK. Um, and then Wings asks Wings is a regular contributor to our Q&A's. Um, they ask, my spouse is a healthcare worker and got the first dose of the vaccine. Should the immediate family get the vaccine sooner or wait for the regular schedule? I don't know if that's an option, actually. 
Yeah, I don't think that's an option either. So I think um, if you are in the priority one group, like a healthcare worker, frontline healthcare worker, like working in the emergency department or a long-term care home, you are eligible for the vaccine and can be vaccinated. I think, uh, you know, the question is, is the other household at increased risk because someone is vaccinated? The idea is the vaccine will protect you. Um, it will protect you from severe illness, from getting severely sick from COVID. Um, and so it, it just because you're vaccinated doesn't mean that the rest of your household is at higher risk. Um, right. Okay. Uh, and then Justin asks, um, I know things look very dark right now. Are we going to see a positive difference as we come closer to summertime with more vaccinations occurring? Uh, there's no question that uh, the vaccines are our hope. They do work. We know that they work in the clinical trials. So it's about how many vaccines can we get into our province? How many can we deliver uh, to, to get uh, some of that additional protection? We also know, though, that, that, that vaccines are an added um, measure. So if we continue with our measures right now, we're at the stay-at-home stay uh, orders. We know that those stay-at-home orders work because we've seen them work in, in March. And so if we can get the virus down to lower levels and can continue with our precautions until we get more vaccinated, then the summer can uh, can look different from, a des from the way it looks right now, for sure. Right, absolutely. And I think we've seen over time, this, this whole past 10 plus months now, things change weekly, you know, things that it's or daily, it's not it's it doesn't because it looks doom and gloom right now. It, it may not be that way, even a, you know, a couple of months from now. I think we saw that last summer as well when things were, were doing better. That's right. Sometimes when you're in the midst of, of a wave of high cases, it's hard to imagine that you'll ever get out of it. But we have gotten out of it before. And so um, I think that that's that's really important to, to remember. There's hope. We keep our fingers crossed. There's hope. Um, okay, um, Lenora asks, and this is not something I've heard of before, so uh, Lenora asks, any word on the Canadian Medicago vaccine? So uh, Medicago is a, a, a Quebec-based uh, company uh, that uses plant-based technology for vaccination. Again, it's uh, on the list of vaccines that may be coming for COVID, but nothing that I, uh, nothing that's uh, more immediate. I have not heard that they've provided uh, any results yet uh, to Health Canada. That's really the next step. Like if we think that a vaccine is going to be available, have, have, has Health Canada started reviewing the data? And that's uh, really the next step for them uh, once they have their data ready. Okay. Um, and then I think there was actually a similar question um, about a Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Um, Matt, uh, I'm assuming it's vaccine. He says, I saw that uh, Johnson and Johnson was near completion with talks of submitting in February. Um, if things move along according to that projected timeline, do you think the Johnson and Johnson vaccine then would be rolled out in March? Like how long? Yeah, so these are Again, AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson. Again, we're we're hopeful that. Uh, but again, nothing is being fast tracked. So if even if they've submitted uh, the data, but there are some questions about it, they need to provide more data or this or that. It will not be fast tracked to be uh, approved without the, the the proper rigors that are in place in the back end, and so. Um, I, I, I think that it's okay. It's okay if it's delayed because the science has to make sure that it is safe and the vaccine works. And that's looking at that data piece. Okay. Um, and then, um, okay, a Ellie asks, uh, if getting the COVID once doesn't guarantee that you won't get it ever again, um, even though you have the antibodies, how does the vaccine work in that case? Are there different types of antibodies? Yeah, so it's not clear that the people who get COVID again, whether they still have antibodies, uh, you can you it, it, you expect once you've had COVID that you develop antibodies. The question is, how long will those antibodies in your body last? And so, if you've had COVID infection, for some people, it uh, from it seems that the antibodies themselves are um, less uh, less likely to be there uh, many months afterwards. Now, what about when you get vaccinated? That's the question. Will the same thing happen? We don't quite know that. We know that at least for uh, many months, the vaccine is offering protection. Again, we have to keep track of that. But the one thing about the vaccine is that if it looks like the antibodies are waning, um, 
and people are getting COVID despite being vaccinated, often giving a booster dose can help. And so you see that in ch children, for example, in infants, when they get their primary series, they're getting uh, multiple doses. Those are booster doses, again, to get the immune system to produce more antibodies that will uh, stick. Right. And like we've discussed this before, we're not even sure if this might turn into one of those yearly things that you have to take, like the flu vaccine, or maybe it's every couple of years, maybe it's a couple of months. We don't know the vaccine life, essentially, right? That's right. We don't. And the reason why we don't know it is because we just haven't had the vaccine around for, for long enough. But even still, we don't need to wait for that because we know with other vaccines, we get started. We know that it's safe. We know that it works for the time that we know that it works for. And beyond that, we can assess and, and provide recommendations uh, uh, based on what, what we're finding six months, a year, two years from now. Right. Um, OK, let's move on to Karen's question. Um, this is a good question. Karen asks, what happens if I test positive with COVID between my two vaccine injections? What does one do? So that has happened, actually, in the trials. Uh, people got vaccinated, and then a few days later, or, or many days later, they got COVID. Uh, some of it was because they were incubating. They already had COVID uh, infection in them. They, it didn't, um, they didn't have symptoms, though, so they got the vaccine, and then they developed COVID. So we think that, that in that case, it's not um, the vaccine didn't even have a chance to protect you. But even still, after the first dose, you know, one to two weeks later, you get protection, but even still, not everyone does. So you could still get COVID in that time frame. And uh, the recommendation there would be, I mean, uh, the question that you would still continue with that second dose right now. Um, because it's either the vaccine didn't have a chance to work yet because you were already incubating, or um, you just had the one dose and um, you got COVID, so you need that booster. Um, but it might be that you wait a little bit longer. Like, of course, you're not gonna get vaccinated when you're still infectious or contagious with, with the virus. And as well, we know the vaccine is not gonna be 100%. So even people who have two doses, some of those may still go on to get, to get COVID. Um, and there would be no recommendation right now that they get uh, revaccinated uh, in that scenario. Okay, so even if, you get both doses of the vaccine, you go on to get COVID after that, you, you don't have to get another dose of the vaccine, essentially. That's right. Right now, there's no recommendation for that. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. More vaccine questions. Um, Jackie asks, as a person with allergies to many medications, along with asthma and COPD, it's my understanding that I should not take this vaccine until they do more work on it. What would you suggest? I don't agree with that. So the vaccine, actually, the, the re people who should not get the vaccine are people who have a specific severe allergy to any of the ingredients in the vaccine. And so for both the Moderna and the Pfizer, it means uh, PEG, polyethylene glycol, which is actually in a lot of things, we actually don't realize it. So if you have a severe PEG allergy, you would have known that because by taking uh, an easy swallow tablet or a liquid gel cap or, or having a colonoscopy or, or ever taking a laxative, you probably actually already took polyethylene glycol and didn't have a reaction to it. So, um, and then for the Moderna, there's a, an ingredient called uh, tromethamine, which is uh, allergy to, to dyes, for example, like IV contrast dyes. Um, so those are the real reason people who really uh, should not get vaccinated or should speak to their allergist about it. But if you have just in general food allergies or other drug allergies, um, you can be vaccinated. Now, if you have an allergy to an IV medication or a medication that was given um, uh, like at a hospital, well, then we might say stay for 30 minutes longer just to make sure because most of those severe allergic reactions occur within the first 15 to 30 minutes. Right, absolutely. And doctor, just so everybody knows, where can we find the exact ingredients of both these vaccines? It's, I know it's available, but where can we find them? You know what, if you go to our website, uh, um, toronto.ca slash COVID, uh, we have a tab there for vaccines. And we actually have information on both of the vaccines available. Um, there's a screening tool that lists what the ingredients are. And so you could certainly go there and find that. Perfect, perfect. Because we've had that question a few times now. Okay, let's go to Lena. Um, Lena asks, what are the long-term side effects of the vaccine? And how many people out of those who have been vaccinated so far have had, again, same question, adverse reactions that have prevented them from carrying out normal activities. 
So we we don't have long-term data, like a year worth data. We have data up to several months. Uh, the What they found is that some of those um, side effects that you might consider longer term side effects are equal in the placebo group and the uh, vaccine group. Um, we do know, though, that if you actually got COVID, you can, there are some long term effects of actually having had the infection, those long haulers. Um, and so uh, we don't see evidence for that in the vaccine. Um, but we don't we don't have all of the we, we haven't had the vaccine around for that long. Uh, but that's the balance is that we know that the disease itself is severe, can give us these long term effects. The vaccine so far, uh, by science, we don't expect it and we haven't seen it uh, in the clinical trials. And so that is part of that informed consent process. Yeah, absolutely. You have to weigh the pros and cons for yourself, for sure. Um, OK, and then. Rachel, uh, this is something we've come across before as well. Rachel asks, why are we not using treatments like in Invermectin? for treatment in Canada. Um, she says that it's it's proven apparently to get rid of COVID, um, but you know, why aren't we using that instead of a vaccine? So uh, treatments uh, for COVID actually have to be uh, regulated through Health Canada as well too. There's a regulatory process for uh, drugs as well. And so if something hasn't made it this way, either they haven't applied for uh, um, uh, to the regulators or it hasn't been approved. Um, okay. Um, Jennifer asks, uh, I understand that masking and social distance is going to have to continue until we get herd immunity. Um, why is it not possible for those that have had their two doses and have immunity from COVID, why aren't they allowed to unmask and then slowly the rest of the population can unmask as they get their two doses of the vaccine and gain immunity? The reason why we're not making that recommendation is because right now we know that if you get vaccinated, you're protected from uh, getting sick from COVID, getting a severe infection from COVID. But what we don't know is if could you get an asymptomatic infection? Could you still get a mild infection that you're not aware of and still spread the virus? And so until we understand that, um, you're, even people who are vaccinated right now could still, like, we just don't know whether they could still spread the virus. Right. And a mask, of course, protects other people from your droplets. So that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And the masking protects, protect, like, even if you're asymptomatic and are shedding, it will, it, it, it will work in that situation as well. Right. Right. Okay. So that brings us to the end of our vaccine questions. We still have a few minutes left, so I'll try and squeeze in the other questions that we've had. Um, you, you just mentioned actually long haulers and the long-term effects. So I'll, two people have asked this question. I'll read out Candace's question. Why isn't there more focus on the long-term effects of COVID on previously healthy young people? She says, along with many others, I've been struggling with debilitating symptoms for 10 months. Uh, and all we hear about is the recently recovered cases. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I'm sorry that you're still struggling. Um, I do know that there are some studies ongoing uh, in the US uh, looking at this, trying to characterize this, trying to see how often it is, what are some of the symptoms? Are there any treatments? What can we do about this? Um, you're right, the numbers don't talk about um, how many are, you know, we say that you're recovered from being infectious, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're recovered from the long-term effects of COVID. And so that is certainly something that we, we need to talk more about. I, I totally agree with you. Absolutely. And doctor, some of the symptoms that people have been talking about are like chronic fatigue, brain fog, that kind of stuff. Um, when it comes as a result of COVID, are the treatments for those things traditional treatments or would we actually have to find different treatments because it resulted from COVID? Like chronic fatigue, I used to have a vitamin D deficiency and I was constantly fatigued. I don't suppose that's the same treatment for something like this. Yeah, I think this is what we have to figure out is what are the treatments for it? And um, some of these things don't have very good treatments, even when it's not COVID that causes them. And so I think this is exactly right. We have to figure out what may work. Are, are there medications? Are there vitamins? Are there, you know, uh, diet, exercise, sunlight? Like it's hard to know. Um, and so these are the things that, that we need to, to have better answers for. Absolutely. Okay. And then... Um... This is actually very recent. This happened yesterday. We found out that inmates um, at a particular facility in Ontario are getting COVID. Um, and so RRP asks, why are inmates getting COVID when they do not go outside um, and the guards are protected with masks? 
Would this mean that the masks aren't working or the guards or other people are not wearing them? Um, and why aren't the guards tested? So uh, uh, inmates who live uh, in, in these facilities, we call these congregate care settings, congregate settings. So it's similar to um, living on residence or at a camp or in a group home or even like a long-term care, like it's that kind of a setting. And so often inmates will live in their quarters with uh, other people. They will be in close contact with them. It's hard to maintain a physical distance at all times. And so it, it is, it is, possible and common that if uh, one inmate has COVID, wherever they got it from, maybe they brought it in, maybe they, um, that it can spread and it can spread uh, quickly sometimes without uh, control measures in place. And it's related to the setting um, because uh, people are living in close quarters with one another. Right, absolutely. Um, okay, Minu asks, uh, if one person in the household is COVID positive and one is negative, after 14 days of quarantine, if the COVID negative person is symptomatic, does that mean the person needs to isolate all over again? The person who recently had COVID and someone got COVID from you, uh, they don't need to isolate in that particular situation. But if they've recovered and then now, you know, uh, weeks and weeks later, someone gets COVID, then that's a different situation, which would require self-isolation. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Shailendra asks, Shailendra is a regular contributor as well. Shailendra asks, um, let's say if all members in the household are positive, do they have to wear masks in the house uh, and should they all be isolating from each other? Uh, well, uh, the, the, the point is, is to put the masks on and to stay separate before everyone turns positive. Once everyone is positive, um, there's no one else to, to spread the virus to, but it is certainly important to, to wear masks uh, when you're going out. Like I think that the whole point of the masks is to keep your germs to yourself. I, I still think that's a good idea, especially when you're contagious. Um, but uh, you want to be able to put the masks on, keep the distance, wash your hands, have a separate bathroom, all of those things before others in the household uh, get sick with COVID. Right. And then, but if you are all sick with COVID, should you be isolating from each other as well, like in your own rooms? Or if you're all sick, you're all sick, right? If you're all sick at the same time, uh, you know, the virus has kind of spread itself and, and burnt itself out. But I still think you have to be careful because sometimes you can get uh, a secondary bacterial infection, you can get a pneumonia, you can get other things that can still spread. And so it is still important to be able to maintain that, uh, you know, those infection control principles, because you don't want to spread other things, maybe COVID had spread, but you don't want to spread now a bacterial pneumonia to someone else. But Absolutely, because one would think that if you're all sick, you're all just in it, in it together, you might as well get over it together. But you're right, the secondary infections is, is a quite a concern as well. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's, we have one more question I think I can squeeze in. Um, Mark asks, I go for a daily walk and sometimes someone coughs in the air just a minute before I have to eventually walk through there or a runner zips past me and is exhaling really heavily, uh, leaving minimal distance between us. How long do res respiratory droplets remain in the air outdoors during winter? And are these quick encounters considered high risk for COVID? Yeah, so I mean, a, a good question, right? This piece on ventilation is, is so important. We know for COVID and we know outdoors, I mean, if it's a windy day, uh, and the wind is blowing away that cough, well, then the risks are actually very low. Um, def definitely, you know, we say that those quick passes are lower risk. If someone, however, quickly passes you and coughs right on you, that's a higher risk. And I can't, I can't uh, say that that isn't. Um, you know, wearing a mask when you're outdoors in those situations is something to consider. Uh, I know that people are trying to be uh, mindful and respectful of the space and keeping that distance as much as they can. Um, so the risk is certainly much, much lower than it would be uh, in an indoor setting like that. Um, but risks are never really zero. Um, and so if you feel like you're encountering that situation quite often when you're going for a walk, then you might want to consider, uh, you know, other things that you can do, um, like walking at a different time, picking a different route to walk on, wearing a mask, that kind of thing. 
absolutely. Personally, what I do is I give everybody a wide berth. I just walk this way if somebody's coming this way. <laughs> on, uh, on that note, thank you, doctor. It is one o'clock now. Thank you so much for joining us and answering all of these questions. Uh, we will have more with the doctor next week. If you didn't have a chance to submit questions, you can still do so. We'll put up another article very soon. Thank you, doctor. Okay, bye. Bye.